for. Hi, and welcome to another hour or so with inspiring writers in this truly extraordinary benefit series celebrating Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary that features readings and conversations with new and emerging writers, as well as established authors and poets who like today's terrific guests have all been published in AQR. You can find recordings of previous programs at our website at aqreview.org and our YouTube channel. Today we have three exceptional short story writers and creative writer teachers, writing teachers, blah, 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 excuse me, with us. And we are lucky enough to share the next hour with them. I'm Heather Lendy and on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts, welcome. We're hosted by the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center, thank you. And thank you, especially to our uh, guest writers and to you for being here. Gunas Chish, as we say in Haines, Alaska, where I am today on the sunny, cold, frozen banks of the Chilkat River on the homeland of the Clinkett, Jilkat Kwan, and Jilkut Kwan. While this reading is free, AQR, like all literary journals, could use your help. So uh, please consider a donation. And thank you very much to those of you that have already donated as we're well on our way towards our goal of $15,000. And now I'd like to introduce Ronald Spatz, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, a professor of English at the University of Alaska. Ron is a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution to Literary Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's four decades plus of leadership and vision, Alaska Quarterly Review has created strong connections between Alaska and the larger literary community in the United States. We're, we're going down south today and abroad and AQR has been influential in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Thank you, Heather, and welcome everyone. Uh, this event, as Heather said, is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Before we would begin, um, I want to make um, a few important acknowledgements and echo um, one of them that Heather mentioned. We are very grateful to the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event, to Web907 for its web support, and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, all of which make this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage, and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with grateful, gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. Today, we are pleased to pre present a trio of award-winning uh, fiction writers, uh, Carrie Holliday, Ashley Wurzbacher and Daniel J. O'Malley. Joining me today, uh, you met Heather Lendy, who is our uh, primary uh, moderator. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take Good Care of the Garden and the Dogs, Find the Good, which is this year's Alaska Reads book, and her recently published Of Bears and Ballots. And now to begin, I send it over to Heather. Thank you. I, it is really my privilege to introduce um, the writers today. Carrie Holliday will be reading first, and Carrie has published two novels and six collections of short stories, including Brides in the Sky, The Quick Change Artist, and Horse People, about which Bobby Ann Mason wrote, the writing is so wonderful, you keep going, enthralled, never wanting this gorgeous prose to end. More than a hundred of Carrie's short stories or essays have appeared in journals and anthologies, including the Alaska Quarterly Review, Black Warrior Review, Blackbird, Carolina Quarterly, 
the Cincinnati Review, Echo Tone, Epic, Five Points, the Florida Review, the Georgia Review, Glimmer Train, Gulf Coast, the Hudson Review, Idaho Review, the Kenyon Review, Missouri Review, Oxford American, Prairie Schooner, Sewanee, Shenandoah, Southern Humanities Review, the Southern Review, Tin House, Virginia Quarterly Review, and New Stories from the South, the Year's Best. She's also received fellowships from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts. She won an O. Henry Prize for a story which first appeared in APUR. A native of Virginia, Carrie is a professor emeritus at the University of Memphis, where she has served as director for the Creative Writing Program and was named a first Tennessee professor. She's a core faculty member in the Low Res MFA program at Converse College and this spring, she's the Fisher Family Writer in Resident at Penn State. Carrie Holliday, who said, fiction is a chameleon. It's story and poetry and truth. Ashley Wurstbacher's debut short story connection, Happy Like This, was the winner of the 2019 John Simmons Short Fiction Award, a National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree, and a New York Times Editor's Choice. Oprah Magazine, said Wurzbacher's incisive polychromatic story collection centers on the dizzying complexities of female friendships, how they fray and mend over time and are often imbued with the intensity of love affairs. Ashley is originally from Titusville, Pennsylvania and she is currently in uh, Birmingham, Alabama where she teaches creative writing at the University of Montevallo. Her work has also appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review the Iowa Review, the Kenyon Review, Prairie Schooner, the Cincinnati Review, Colorado Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, Gettysburg Review, and elsewhere. Ashley Wurzbacher, who says, fiction is meant to be shared. And I don't know many serious fiction writers who would say they write only for themselves. I'm certainly one of my toughest critics and I have to love and stand by what I've written before I feel ready to share it with others. She says, I'm an important member of my audience, but I'm not the only member. If there's a particular audience I'm most invested in writing towards, it's women. Women who are struggling to define themselves and to figure out what their lives should or can be. Daniel J. O'Malley's story, Simon, initially published in Granta, is a finalist for the Sunday Times Audible Short Story Award. His story, Bridge, initially published in Alaska Quarterly Review, was included in 2016's The Best American Short Stories Anthology and broadcast on the NPR program Selected Shorts. His fiction has also appeared in Gulf Coast, Ninth Letter, and other publications. Daniel grew up in Missouri and currently lives in West Virginia. He's been on the faculty at Marshall University there since 2012. He holds degrees in anthropology and fiction writing his teaching includes a variety of classes in literature, composition, and creative writing. He also serves as an advisor and the English department's coordinator of undergraduate programs. Daniel J. O'Malley, who says, most of what I do is short stories. In my experience, a big difference between trying to write a story and trying to write something longer is that in a story, you at least have the illusion that you might find the ending in a reasonable amount of time. For me, a story still usually takes a while, but the illusion is real. With a story, I appreciate the way you can kind of lean back and keep the whole thing in view. It feels more like an object that way. I know, we can't wait to hear from them, right? Um, Carrie, um, welcome. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Ron and Heather. And thanks and happy Valentine's Day to everybody who's with us. This series has been lighting up my Sundays. I'm delighted to be part of it and to read with Ashley and Daniel. This story, Mary Goes Sorry, was in Alaska Quarterly Review in 1998. And the AQR has been important to me for a very long time. Um, uh, just a very brief intro to the story. The characters' names and situations are all made up, but it does have roots in real life tragedy. And uh, many of you will be familiar with a case uh, 
that occurred in 1993, three little boys were murdered in West Memphis, Arkansas. Rumors went flying about satanic activity. It was just gossip, but it took hold. Three teenage boys were wrongfully accused, arrested, tried, and convicted, and imprisoned, and despite no evidence, no real evidence. Um, and they were in prison for 18 years, and then they were finally freed uh, on the basis of new evidence. Uh, the tragic murders of the children remain unsolved. My story takes place in the immediate aftermath of the murders and the trials. So it's a story of the mid 1990s. When I wrote it, I had just moved to Memphis and I had just read Fever, John Edgar Wideman's novella about a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793. And I saw parallels with the West Memphis case, the fear, the speculation that had been unleashed in the community by those murders, like a fever. And that's what this story is really about. The title, Mary Goes Sorry, is an ancient word that means a tale that contains both joy and sorrow. The subject matter does not sound like Valentine's Day, but there is love in the story. It's much too long to read in just 15 minutes, so I'll just read a few parts and the sections in the story do stand alone. Mary goes sorry. It begins in an Arkansas courtroom, the trial of a young man for the deaths of three boys. It begins in late May, a year after the murders, on a day so hot that the air conditioning can't keep up with the sweat on the 17-year-old defendant's face. He has confessed, though his lawyer protests that the confession signed in Sid's childlike scrawl means nothing. Sid Treadway is mentally retarded, he says, and the police coerced him. Sid Treadway's long, scarred, dumbfounded face follows his lawyer's striding figure to the bench and back, and then his mild green eyes are distracted by a cicada thrumming on a courtroom windowsill. He recalls the last such insect he saw at his sister's house, which died loudly, clatteringly, in a dish of lemons. She had planned to use the lemons in a pie. She has not come to the courtroom. Only Sid's father is there, Big Sid, who when his son was arrested, had burst into sobs like a child. There will be another trial for Sid's alleged conspirators, one of them widely regarded as the ringleader. Sid's trial is separate because he confessed, implicating the other two. Sid Treadway helped slay three young boys and left them hogtied and drowning in a ditch, says the prosecutor. That's what the jury believes, swiftly convicting him, but that is just the prelude, the beginning. It begins again in the trial of Benedict James, the devil-worshipping, girlfriend-biting dropout who tutored his disciples Sid Treadway and Robert Abt in evil, so the prosecutor says, six weeks later in the same courtroom who had targeted his three victims, their eight-year-old faces, one slyly mugging, another somber, a third the most lovable, expansively smiling, have decorated newspapers for months now. If the trial of Sid Treadway was easy, the trial of Benedict James and Robert Apt is as simple as calling Satan by his name. In Benedict's closet, there's nothing but black t-shirts and black pants, a police officer testifies, and his diary has poems he wrote to the devil. Benedict's pregnant girlfriend, Victorine Stark, sits every day in the back row. 16, red-haired, beautiful. She has pointed to teeth mark scars on her white neck for the benefit of photographers. She's carrying the child of the man she loves. This is her fate, she says. Her mother, 32 but looking 60, sits beside her embroidering the face of Jesus on a pillowcase. Nobody loves her, she tells reporters, and she'll be grandmother to the devil, but she has a sweet, lovely daughter. I want the best for my girl. Benedict of the shaggy black hair, the fish belly white skin, the deeply scalloped underlip gets sent to hell right there in the courtroom 
as daily the trial ends with a curse. The father of one of the victims, who will himself be on trial within the year for stealing furniture from a neighbor's moving van, rushes Benedict in a ritual that the guards and the jury have come to enjoy. Burn in hell, murderer, you killed my little boy. The guards let him get within arm's length before gently tugging him out the door. Benedict sits unmoved, only his stomach moving fast with his breath, his t-shirt lifting up and down. The other defendant, Robert Apt, is vocal, whereas Benedict says nothing and does not take the stand. Robert Apt denies it all, but he gets confused. To the prosecuting attorney, he explodes, damn you, man, you're trying to mess me up. His lawyer tells the judge that he has advised him against taking the stand, but Robert Apt, age 16, insisted. I'm innocent, he cries. Benedict James is 18, but looks 24 or five. When the judge sentences him to death and asks if he has anything to say, he replies, no, sir. Within six months, he's on television talking to a reporter. Yes, he says he did bite his girlfriend during sex, just a lick, and he demonstrates with his tongue while the reporter shudders. I don't worship Satan. I'm a white witch, a Wiccan, he says. I never said no wise else. He will not talk about the three murdered boys whose faces flash on the TV screen as he is led handcuffed back to death row. Facing the camera, the reporter assures victims that he will be under lock and key until his execution. Victorine Stark, in the trailer she shares with her mother, cuddles her newborn and names him Malachi. That means my messenger, she tells a reporter. On the day before the baby's birth, she saw a crow with a long piece of videotape at its beak. It gave me hope, she says, her red hair spread out on the pillowcase with the Jesus face on it, while her mother spoons macaroni and cheese onto paper plates, inviting the reporter to stay for supper. What do you think was on the videotape? The reporter asks indulgently, the one that the crow was carrying. Victorine laughs, a sad gurgle that has caught on lately among the girls at her school who copy the laugh and the way she wears her plentiful hair, loose with a tiny braid encircling the crown of her head. The videotape would be something pretty. It don't have nothing to do, really, with the crow. It would show the future my baby will have. Rising from her narrow bed, she announces, I've memorized something, something from the Bible, the book of Malachi. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven. The reporter, a young man whose instincts keep him at bay from her, but who has loved her violently since he stepped into her room and heard the Arkansas home honey in her voice says, that's beautiful. Victorine holds, her, holds his gaze with her green eyes, undoes her flouncy white blouse, and nurses the baby. It's getting dark outside. Her mother hovers nearby to light candles that smell of patchouli oil. Victorine says, I still love Benedict, no matter what. She nudges the baby from her breast to draw something from her pocket, a newsprint photo of Benedict bare-chested, his arms flung out in the shape of a cross. That was took just a few days before he was arrested, she says. Sid Treadway took it. You can have it. It's in my heart forever. The reporter turns it over and discovers a coupon for a casino in Tunica, seafood buffet, half price. Victorine says, I can't wait till I'm old enough to go play those slots. I hope things turn out just fine for you, the reporter says, and you too, ma'am, to her mother. You got me thinking, Victorine says. He drives back to Memphis over the bridge with the scent of patchouli in his hair. For years afterward, while he entertains eligible young women in restaurants, 
He grows moody over his wine, imagines rescuing Victorine, taking her to the casinos that she dreams of. He tells himself she'll be old and fat by 19, but it's because of her that he does not marry until he's 40 and the memory of her has faded to an outline of Arkansas trailer and nursing infant. What of the abandoned cotton gin house where satanic rituals were rumored to occur, nicknamed Stonehenge, where word has it that Benedict used to sacrifice dogs, cats, rabbits, and chickens. The farmer who owns it burns the parts that will catch fire and tears down the rest. It had sat so long on the edge of his cotton field, a high-roofed shed, not until after the arrests did it blossom with five-point stars and 666, and the farmer himself scratched its dirt floor for animal bones and found none, although he did discover charred circles, which the police deemed ritualistic. Oh, somebody roasted marshmallows out there, he told police, while his wife said, Henry, that cult stuff is true. You just don't want to believe it. There were orgies going on out there. Do you think it was anybody we know? The police chief assures the public, your German shepherds are safe now. That's what those devil worshipers want, is German shepherds. The farmer resists even that. He doesn't know anyone who owns a German shepherd. Most everybody has hounds. He has a fat yellow lab that lolls in the grass and snaps at flies as he dismantles his troublesome old cotton shed. To the dog, he says, there were never any devil worship meetings here. You know it and I know it. A 15 year old girl named Crystal in love with Robert Apt, although she hardly knows him, she just hopes he remembers her from school. Writes to him every night in the privacy of her room, a room bedecked with angel sun catchers and bowls of potpourri. She knows that sooner or later, her mother will find out about the correspondence. Propped up on her pretty bed, she expects her mother to barge in, knock the clipboard and the pink mist stationery off the bed and say, don't you fool with that killer, you hear me? Yet weeks pass and Crystal mails the letters each morning at the mailbox near her school. Growing bolder, she dis displays a picture of Robert that she clipped from a yearbook. She sticks it in her mirror so she can look at his defiant face when she brushes her thin blonde hair. His eyes follow her movements as she tosses her head, brushing her hair as if it's tresses, a word she doesn't know how she knows. One night, her mother comes in with a basket of fresh clothes, spots the picture, and says, who's this? Crystal puts down her pen. It's who I love. Setting the laundry basket at the foot of the bed, her mother plucks the picture from the mirror. He's one of them three, she says. Crystal waits for outrage, but her mother chuckles. He could be in the church choir. Look at that striped tie and pressed shirt. I write to him every day, Crystal says, and sometimes I go to the prison and visit him. I'm almost grown, don't try to stop me. How can anybody stop their kid from growing up? Her mother says, laying the picture gently on Crystal's dresser. It's just cause he's in jail and will be until he dies that he seems like anything to you. Write to him all you want, but don't expect me to sew you any white gown for a jailbird wedding. I bet he's got sacks of letters from girls. Are you mad, Mama? Crystal asks, confused not by her mother's words. They're nearly what she expected, but by her tone, curiosity mixed with scorn and sadness. Your daddy thinks somebody else did it, but I think they got the right ones. The jury decided and the judge just knew, her mother says. If your Romeo got out tomorrow, he wouldn't seem so hot. Here's your bras and jeans I washed for you. Oh, honey, he can't take you to the prom. Find somebody who can. 
I'm not going to any prom, Crystal says, glorying in the sacrifice. If she chose to, she could spend all afternoon with her hair in curlers, putting on makeup and pulling on a dress with rhinestone straps, but she won't. She will take the bus to the prison on that fine spring day and get home late, smelling the apple blossoms in the air and hearing the distant music. There is talk among the juniors and seniors of holding the prom at the Holiday Inn and her heart nearly bursts with longing to go but no, she tells herself, I will not. Suit yourself, honey, her mother says. Kids think they have to write, have to rent limos now, for God's sake. Your daddy and I had crepe paper streamers strung up in the gym, and it was just as good. Did y'all drink back then? Did you go all the way? Crystal sits up straight. She has never dared to ask her mother these things. Of course we did, we still do, and I bet that shocks you more. Her mother laughs and leaves the room. Crystal sits on her bed, the writing paper scattered across her lap, remembering something, the old fashioned way her grandmother used to address her mother, Crystal's mother. She used to call her daughter with a capital D. Crystal picks up her pen. The memory of her grandmother has awakened a whole chain of memories. Do you remember, she writes to Robert, as if they are 75 instead of 15 and 16. Do you remember the way our elementary school principal used to play chimes before he spoke over the intercom? She writes many other memories, but that's the only one Robert reads. He remembers the principal and he hurls the letter to the floor of his cell with an oath. He still remembers a beating the guy gave him, the old wooden paddle kind, but he can't remember why. There's more to the story, but I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. I, uh, it's a great story. Um, and Ashley, we'll hear from you next. Thanks, Heather and Carrie. Uh, and thanks, Ron, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this series and of the life of AQR more broadly. I'm going to read about a third of a story called Happy Like That from my book, Happy Like This. Um, so happy like that. Lillian has been dead for a week when Elaine remembers the slip of paper tucked in a drawer in her desk that Lillian gave her shortly after beginning an affair with a man only Elaine knew about. It's been five months, Elaine calculates, since Lillian pressed the note into her hand hurrying from work to spend a Friday night with her lover, telling her husband who knows what, leaving their eight-year-old daughter Violet in Elaine's care, as she often did. Five months, but it feels like much longer. Now Elaine digs through the detritus in her desk until she finds it, the yellow post-it, a blackish strip of filth clinging to the adhesive on its underside, bearing Lillian's lover's name and number. In case of emergency, Lillian had said, and Elaine had stashed the post-it away with a nonchalance that struck her now that Lillian was dead, killed by a drunk driver, as callous. It was a thing you said in case of emergency, a casual precaution you took in the same half-hearted way you might locate the exit row on an airplane you assume won't crash, or replace the batteries in a smoke alarm you assume will never go off. Elaine had thought nothing of it. She'd simply accepted the note, proud and pleasantly scandalized to have been entrusted with it. The neatly printed family of digits on its face, the viney cursive scrolls of the lover's name and the secret they signified. At the time, she could not imagine a situation that would require her to put the slip of paper to practical use, but now here is one. Does Lillian's lover know she is gone? Does he have anyone to talk to? 
Elaine doesn't know, but she knows that for better or worse, her best friend loved this man, and she believes that the ache in the pit of her stomach, the hopeless hunger for Lillian's company, qualifies as an emergency. Who could understand better than him? Following Lillian's funeral, Elaine had grabbed desperately for every trace of her friend she could find before they too disappeared. A half empty box of jasmine tea labeled with her name. Her favorite mug, wide and rounded and painted like a strawberry from the common area at the office where they both worked as speech therapists. Private practice, Elaine a specialist in child language disorders, Lillian working mostly with adults with dementia or recovering from strokes or brain injuries. Now, Elaine decides, she will add the lover to this list of consolatory artifacts, mementos of Lillian. She knows that he works odd hours as a canine sergeant with the Department of Corrections and that he too is married. She does not expect him to answer when she calls him just before leaving work on a Wednesday, but he does. Oh, he says when she introduces herself. Elaine, yes, Lillian's told me about you. I was sorry not to meet you at the funeral. You were there? It had been in the paper, of course, on the news, but the lover lives in a different town almost an hour away, a place with its own tragedies, and Elaine had thought it likely that she'd have to break the news of Lillian's death to him. Now, it seems, she'll be spared that particular unpleasantness. She imagines him at the funeral, skulking near the back, unnoticed, grieving privately. The funeral was crowded. Elaine had clung to her husband David's arm and kept to herself. Lillian had many friends, and Elaine had often wondered why Lillian had chosen her as her confidant when so many other options abounded. I'd love to meet you, she says now, surprising herself. I've heard so much about you, and it's been hard, you know. Yes, the lover says. You want to be close to everything she was close to. Elaine nods. She had not expected to propose a meeting, but his explanation for why one is called for suits her. They agree to meet at a tavern on Friday afternoon for a late lunch. He cannot be more than a half hour's drive from the prison where he works, lest he and his dogs be called out on a chase. So she'll travel to his neck of the woods, like Lillian used to do. David had never liked Lillian, not since the two women met at Brookwood after giving birth on the same day and discovered that they had the same profession, though they worked in different places at the time. Elaine for Birmingham Public Schools and Lillian in private practice in the office where they later worked together. Both births had been difficult, both babies premature, both their parents first and only children. David objected to Lillian's irreverent sense of humor, her jokes about the places tiny Violet might fit and where Lillian must therefore be careful not to place or drop her into her handbag in the elastic throat of a tube sock down the toilet. When at last they were released from the hospital, again on the same day, parting ways in front of sliding doors, Lillian kissed Elaine on the cheek and said, can you believe it? She nodded toward the building they'd left, cradling Violet at her breast. They're crazy letting me take this thing home. This was the beginning of the friendship that would come to sit at the center of their lives. Isn't she stunning? Elaine marveled to David on the way home. Her tiny little toes, he said, thinking Elaine meant Mandy, their daughter. No, she said, I mean Lillian. David said he had not cared for the way Lillian called her child a thing. But to Elaine, Lillian's crassness felt like honesty, not blasphemy. She had been afraid to take Mandy home as well into a house that had seemed cozy before, but that now seemed like a death trap with its steak knives and sharp corners. And it refreshed her to hear such apprehension expressed without having to express it herself. The truth was she had not loved Mandy right away. Instead, the, loom the love bloomed in her slowly, building once the girl began to show herself emotionally human, not just physically so. Elaine had required payment of smiles, of laughter, in order to give it. Loving had been an exchange, even with her child. She would die for Mandy now, but it had not always been so. This was the kind of thing she could not tell anyone but Lillian. David still holds that he loved Mandy madly, immediately. But of course he did. It was easy for him. It wasn't fair. 
Mandy had only ever given to him, never taken, and she had taken Elaine's body. She had nearly taken her life. Only Lillian understood. She had been the sole founding board for Elaine's observations, all the things that surprised her about motherhood and marriage, the things no one tells you. As a mother, Lillian was carefree, open and blunt in the way she framed the lessons she imparted on her daughter. No baby talk, no euphemism. Violet had taught Mandy the word vagina before age three, and Lillian teased Elaine relentlessly about the time she would not allow Mandy to bob for apples at another child's birthday party, when Elaine was put off at the sight of the dozen grimy children plunging their faces into a large tub of water, trying with teeth and tongues to trap in their mouths apples that bobbed like fat, red sunbathers in a chop of waves. Elaine had held Mandy on the margins, saying Mandy was ill when, in fact, Elaine was only worried she might become so. She did not see what was so wrong with that, why Lillian had laughed at her, or how her friend could cheer so enthusiastically when her own daughter came up from the bucket with her teeth sunk deep into a germy red delicious, grinning like an imp. Elaine had aspired to soak up some of Lillian's ease, her acceptance of her daughter's individuality. For her own part, Elaine sometimes found it distressing to watch Mandy get older and begin to show flaws that promised to make life hard for her. An insecure streak, a dislike of the sound of others' laughter, an unassuageable conviction that it must be at her expense, and to have thoughts that Elaine would never know. Her child was separate from her. It was both obvious and sad. I don't know, Lillian said when Elaine shared her frustration over the fact of her daughter's miraculous, awful autonomy. I think it's kind of beautiful. This was in the early days on their baby's second birthday when Elaine and Lillian threw a party that was more for them than for the girls. They wore cone-shaped party hats and ate red velvet cake from a box while Violet and Mandy teetered about and bopped each other with balloons having long since rejected their own birthday hats. Why, Elaine whined. Lillian shrugged. It's true, Violet's not me, but that's okay. She's her. They soon grew tired of the party. Elaine stood by the picture window in her Homewood bungalow with Mandy on her hip and the party hat's elastic strap digging into her chin, cone-headed and bored, taking in the houses across the street, all of which were lined with neat gardens, stately and floral magnificent. Who has the time, she complained. How do these women do it? She would have given in to her feelings of inadequacy, letting them pull her down, if not for Lillian. Instead, they rounded up the kids and made a run to a nearby box store, bought out their stock of silk flowers, brought them back to Elaine's, and just before David came home, stuck their plastic stalks into the dirt of her front lawn. The children ate dirt, and the neighbors peeked from between curtains and slowed their cars in front of the house to take in the sudden swell of rainbow blossoms, amused, aghast. And Elaine and Lillian laughed and laughed, earth trapped under the skinny white moons of their nails. It was the kind of thing David just didn't get, like the time Elaine and Lillian swapped wedding rings, Elaine's idea, or the time they went to the derby party at Windwood with buckets on their heads. Why didn't you plant real flowers? He asked Elaine that night. Wouldn't it have been the same amount of work to just do it the right way? Buy something, dig a hole, fill it in? Husbands, let's be honest, Elaine thinks you can find one anywhere. The world is bursting with them. And once you've got one, you can learn from a thousand different sources what to do with him and how. So he won't really get you and you won't really get him. Anyone can tell you to plant flowers the right way, but you'll never find another Lillian, no. On Wednesday evening, she tells David she'll be going to see her mother in Tuscaloosa on Friday. And perhaps she really will go there, she tells herself, after lunch with the lover. It would not be out of the way. She should pack a bag just in case. On Thursday, after work, she gets a bikini wax. Been a while, says her esthetician. I'm so busy, says Elaine. She feels defensive, like she's being accused of something. The rip and tear of the hard wax and the seared feeling of her bare skin afterward feel punitive, but she has not done anything wrong attending to her overgrown bush. After her wax, she stops at Publix and buys a package of frozen enchiladas. 
to stash in the freezer at home in case she's gone overnight. As she waits in the checkout line with the box puddling the grocery conveyor belt, she thinks of her indispensability to her family, David's helplessness in the kitchen, Mandy's myriad quirks and needs with a mix of resentment and pride. On Friday, after sending Mandy to school, she showers, then stands in her closet, unsure what to wear. She thinks of how Lillian will never again stand in her closet, unsure what to wear. She dons a funereal but sexy black, black dress, then reconsiders, and in what may be an act of overcorrection, ghosts herself in a white mock neck sleeveless sweater, an ice blue cashmere pencil skirt, and a pair of low silver pumps. She has no plan for this day other than to think and talk of Lillian with her lover, but she finds herself afflicted with a nervous energy that she attempts to release by pacing around the room, moving her arms aimlessly, running out the clock, speaking to herself aloud. Yes, the silver earrings, fearing her lobes. Oh, a goldfinch, looking out the window, definitely the blue, reconsidering her choice of skirt, then unreconsidering. The sound of her voice in the empty house reassures and splits her. She's both a woman preparing for lunch and a woman watching a woman prepare for lunch, objectively observing her actions, putting down a record of their purity and triviality, her innocence, nothing to see here. She knows enough to know that this splitting and recording, this half felt sense of censure stems from her guilty awareness of the lie she told David about going to Tuscaloosa. But was it a lie? She might go, yet. Yes, and besides, why would he care? Why must he hear about every lunch she eats, every private ritual by which she mourns Lillian, who after all was her friend, not his, this grief hers, not his? And she sees for the first time how easy it could be, how smoothly she could spin a web of excuses and half-truths, the silky threads of secrets. His trust has purchased her this ease. At last, she gathers her bag, tosses it into the trunk of her car, and slides beneath the wheel. She should take him something, the lover. Lillian left no gift, no lock of hair, no letter. A dozen roses, then. Red. No. White. No. Red. No. White. She buys the flowers on her way out of town and hits the freeway, where she gets stuck behind a sewage truck, the stool bus sluggish and yellow painted, just taking its time in the fast lane. She passes on the right, reading, where your fecal matters. Once again, she has the sense that she's being reprimanded, though she's innocent of any and all definable wrongdoing, other than being alive in a world from which Lillian's been taken. On her way south on 65, she thinks of the lover. Though they've never touched, she knows that he is quiet and earnest in his lovemaking, She's familiar with his habit of twining his fingers in his lover's hair like a cat's claws. She knows that he apprehends criminals in his dreams, that once in his sleep, he pinned Lillian's hands behind her back, dreaming of capture, and held her down with both her wrists, viced in one damp palm until she screamed him awake. And she knows how tenderly he held her afterward, awake, repentant. The lover can know no such things about Elaine, and yet, realizing that she is his only remaining link to Lillian, the closest he can come to her now, Elaine feels herself imbued with an eroticism that is no less potent for its despondency. Her stomach turns as she pulls into the tavern's parking lot, right on time. It is mid-May and a humid 90 degrees, and the heat hits her before she even opens the car door. She leaves the flowers on the passenger seat. She should not have brought them. She enters the tavern where the lover waits, already seated, a table for two, two full water glasses sweating, two wet rings on wood. And I will stop there. Thanks again so much for uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ashley. And Daniel. Well, I'd like to start also by saying thank you to Ron and Heather and everyone at Alaska Quarterly Review and everyone at the museum as well. Um, it's a real honor to participate in this event. Uh, and thank you, of course, to Carrie and Ashley as well. Um, 
before I start, I just want to say a little bit about my history with AQR. It was one of the first journals that I started paying attention to, and that would be about 20 years ago, give or take, which feels to me like a long time. Um, so it was a thrill whenever I had a story published in the magazine, and then um, a thrill a year or so later when I got a phone call from an Alaska area code. And, I, and the first thing I thought of was Alaska Quarterly Review, because I know no one in Alaska. And sure enough, it was Ron letting me know that the story was going to be reprinted in the Best American Anthology. Um, and this is a lovely memory to me, and a strange memory, because I had, when the phone rang, been staring down at a bathtub filled with water, and I couldn't understand why it wouldn't drain. And I mention that now because for some reason I mentioned it to Ron on the phone, even though it had nothing to do with what was happening, of course. Um, and what struck me was that he seemed genuinely interested. He seemed like if I wanted to, he would troubleshoot with me whatever was happening with the plumbing. But then pretty quickly, I think we both um, decided that we didn't care a whole lot about the bathtub. And then we talked more about the anthology. Um, and I just couldn't not mention that for some reason. Um, and the, tonight, what I'm going to read is a story that was published uh, several years ago um, called Uncle, but it's one that I've been tinkering with again more recently. Uh, it's, it's fairly short. So Uncle. Some days she was the driver. The man would say he was tired. His eyes were sore. Could the girl take over for a while? Of course she could, but she liked to make him wait. She liked to hear him say, please, then say it again, louder and again, until finally he would reach across the seat and shake her by the knee, the girl pretending she was asleep, her head bent forward, drool stringing down to her jeans, though she would never drool for real. This was only pretend. When eventually she said yes, yes, she would like to drive, he'd help her over the armrest and into his lap. Careful, he'd say, careful now. And then he would take his hands off the wheel so she could steer. They drove across Missouri this way, across Kansas, Colorado, until they got to the mountains and turned and headed north up to Nebraska. Then east, all the way into Iowa and back down, and now they were in Missouri again. It was September. Occasionally there were trees, solid seeming walls of them along the roadside, but mostly all they passed were fields. When the girl wasn't driving, she liked to look through the binoculars. She liked trying to see what the people were doing in the houses at the far ends of the fields. When she saw animals, she would ask if they could stop the car, if they could pull over and maybe try to get one of the cows or a horse or every once in a while, goats to come over so she could feed one through the fence. But then the man would ask what exactly she thought she would feed this animal because horses and cows and goats wouldn't eat those little pretzels like the girl did all day, now would they? And before the girl could say that this wasn't really a problem, surely she could find something outside for the animal to eat, some grass maybe, or a flower. The man would have pushed just a little bit harder on the gas and the car would already be past the field with the animal in it and the girl would be up on her knees in the passenger seat, twisting backward to see it through the binoculars. <laughs> When the man said he was tired now, they stopped at a motel. It wasn't even dark. The girl knew the routine and ducked down below the level of the window while the man walked into the lobby. Back in the car, he drove around to the shaded side of the building and she stayed close to the man's leg as they made their way up the stairs to a room on the second floor. They ate pretzels and potato chips and drank apple juice from the vending machine. There were two beds in the room, and the man let the girl choose which one she wanted. But then he said it wasn't fair because he couldn't see the TV from his bed, so he came over to hers and they sat there side by side, leaning on the headboard while the girl clicked through the channels. 
After the man fell asleep, the girl turned the TV down low and stood up and stretched. She cracked her knuckles one by one and watched as the man stayed sleeping. Then she went to the bathroom and turned on the water in the tub. She pulled up on the lever that closed the stopper, then wadded toilet paper and packed it down into the drain just to be sure. Outside, the sun was just beginning to set. The girl had remembered the binoculars, but she'd forgotten the hat. She liked to wear the man's hat sometimes when he was asleep, a disguise. He always wore it himself when he was awake, even in the car. Or else, he said, his head would get sunburned and the skin would peel and blow all over the car. The girl pretended now that she was being followed and crept down the stairs and across the crumbling parking lot. She paused in the shadow of a truck an 18-wheeler, and turned the binoculars back toward the motel, room 202. No movement. The motel was situated next to the highway, and for a while the girl lay in the ditch and watched the cars as they passed. She turned the binoculars around so that the cars seemed small and far away. But really they were right there. She could feel her hair whipping back, lifting as they passed. Then after the sun went down, the girl crossed the parking lot back to the motel. She counted the rooms that were lit up and the rooms that were dark. She walked around inspecting license plates, then started collecting little pebbles and pieces of concrete, putting them in her pockets, imagining all the things a person might be able to accomplish if their pockets were big enough and they could find enough good, smooth rocks. And this is what she was doing when a woman touched her on the shoulder and asked, if the girl, asked the girl if she was lost. The girl shook her head. Where are your parents? When the girl didn't answer, the woman said, well, let's get you inside then. And she took the girl's hand and led her into the lobby where it smelled like fried chicken and there was a TV on over in the corner. The woman told the girl to go have a seat on the couch over there which the girl did. She watched the woman ring the bell on the counter and wait. The girl tried to listen while the woman from the parking lot whispered to the woman who came out from the curtain behind the counter. The woman from the parking lot was thin. She had hair that was brown like the girl's hair, but longer. She had a jacket made from the skin of a cow and sticking out from the jacket's sleeves, the woman's hands seemed to the girl especially pink. The girl studied her own hands, which were not clean. She brought the binoculars to her eyes and looked at the women up close, but she still couldn't hear what they said. The woman who worked at the motel shrugged and pulled a phone from under the counter and set it where the brown-haired woman could reach. But the brown-haired woman turned around approached the girl and squatted down on the floor. Those are nice, she said, pointing at the binoculars. The girl nodded. Do you know what room your parents are in? The girl sat still for a moment, waiting, thinking, then shook her head. Is it down here, the woman asked, or did you go up the stairs? The girl waited another moment, then leaned forward and whispered that her parents were dead. When the woman didn't say anything in response, the girl went on, they're up there. She pointed, meaning not upstairs, but higher in the sky. If I'm not good, the girl said, I'll never get there. The woman was quiet. Her throat moved like she was swallowing. The girl said, can I stay with you? Then she lifted the binoculars and held them to her eyes backwards so that the brown haired woman was small. Soon the woman was standing and walking back to the counter, to the phone, and the girl eased down from the couch and tiptoed toward the door. And then, when she got outside, she ran. She ran the length of the motel, rounded one corner and then another, and then up the stairs until she was back at room 202, where the door was open just enough. The man was awake now, he was watching TV again. He had the remote in one hand and a can of sun-kissed in the other. Juice, he called it. But he wasn't saying anything now. He didn't look at the girl. He wouldn't. 
She knew that. Their bags were stacked one on one on the other by the door. Likely they would leave soon, the girl thought, back to the highway. He would say he couldn't sleep if he couldn't trust her, so why stay? Probably he would tell her that if this is the way she planned to behave, then maybe it was time to ride in the trunk again for a while. How would she like that? Then probably the girl would cry and the man would close his eyes and sigh and they would compromise. She would not have to ride in the trunk, just in the back seat, which would be fine with her, except that he'd probably also make her put the seatbelt on. And then, even if he did let her keep holding the binoculars, she wouldn't be able to get up on her knees and see anything. When the commercials ended, the girl saw that he was watching a baseball game which meant that it would probably still be a while yet before they left. She passed between the bed and the television, ducking so she wouldn't block his view, and sat on the floor, close enough to the bathroom that she could feel the carpet wet through her jeans. The baseball game was somewhere west, where there was still daylight. Everyone was standing, the men on the field, the people in the seats, everyone. The girl tried to concentrate on the game, there was something here that people found fascinating. She stared at the screen for a while without even blinking. Then she gave up. She climbed up on the bed and leaned back on the pillows and pretended to sleep. And that is the end. Thank you again very much. Oh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Oh, I was right on the edge of my seat the whole time. And um, Thank all of you. And we do have a, a few minutes left. And I, I guess the, the, and this might be a, a kind of a big question, but one that struck me as you were all um, reading and, you know, this idea that, um, you know, what's, what's fiction, what's real? I, I mean, the, there's, you know, that, that uh, saying that it's, you know, the truth that tells a lie or the lie that tells the truth. I mean, what, can you talk to, to us a little bit about, about what is, is true in a, in a story that you're creating um, and, and how, how that, that works? I mean, I know obviously with Carrie's started out with something very true. I don't know the, the genesis of Ashley and, and Daniel's stories, but you know, we all know it comes from somewhere. And, mm -hmm. and it's, even though we say that a story is just a story, it's as true or maybe even more true than something that's in the newspaper say, right? I don't know if you, if you guys wanna talk about that or you, people wanna talk about that or, or not. That's a great question, Heather. And even if a story has some basis in truth, and many of them do, I mean, we pull stories from everywhere. As Faulkner said, stories, ideas come from everywhere, from the telephone book to, to God. And so we pull little bits and pieces or sometimes more than that. And then the story, the characters take on lives of their own and uh, they keep going forward and then they, they may leave uh, some or all of the original scaffolding far behind. Um, and uh, you have to let your characters and, the, and what they want take over. Yeah, and I would also say that while a lot of my stories might start with something I've overheard or witnessed or something that's happened to me um, that adds a more sort of shy and introvert, introverted person. I like that fiction gives me um, a sense of safety or like a, um, it's a mode of concealing what's real while also writing about it, right? So um, it's like, I can write about something that's true or something that's real, but I have this sort of built-in automatic disclaimer that it is ultimately fiction. And so it's no one's business really, like in many ways, right? Like what's the real stuff and what's the made up stuff. Um, I don't have to tell and I don't have, you know, to make that kind of um, very vulnerable kind of divulgence that comes from writing nonfiction, which to me would be really frightening. 
Um, I like that I'm behind this sort of safe screen um, and I can talk about real things and I can talk about feelings I've had or things I've experienced, but no one has to know which ones are mine and which ones are purely made up. <laughs> Daniel, what do you think? I, I have never consciously written anything that was based in fact or my own actual experience. You know, the closest I come is, you know, in a story I might write about somebody finding a turtle. And in my mind, I'm picturing the turtle that I found a long time ago, but it's got nothing to do with my own experience with the turtle. Um, that said, I have, after the fact, sometimes found out when other people mentioned it, how connected to my own experience, something that I thought I was making up was. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I, it's never consciously starting with anything real or from my own life. It's more like a bit of language or a picture starts to come to mind. And then I follow that thing as far as it can go. But, it, you know, that thing begins to seem so real to me that I, I do feel like I'm trying to be faithful to something real, even though it's, you know, it's never existed. It just feels that way to me. Mm -hmm. All, all three of you are, are teachers. Is there um, something that is sort of your go-to advice for um, students that are starting out to write um, short fiction? Is there uh, um, kind of one thing that you make sure you will always tell them? John Gardner's book, The Art of Fiction, is, is still the gold standard. And uh, he says a writer's material is what they care about. So that's very important to, to keep in mind is to write about something that, that you really, uh, that, that you feel in, invested in. I, I love uh, quotes from writers and my students know I've got a million of them. Catherine Ann Porter said uh, that all her fiction was true. Everything had happened to her and she would just rearrange it. Um, and she also emphasized the importance of plot. No plot, my dear, no story. When I read that, I imagine what it may have sounded like in, in, in her voice. And of course, as teachers, we, we learn so much from our students because they're constantly inventing um, and making breakthroughs and just the, not just the pleasure of their writing, but the fun of their company, even virtually is, is a real pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I would, it's hard to, um, to think of like one sort of signature piece of wisdom that I want my students to come away with, but I feel like at, at the more introductory levels, I'm usually uh, preaching just bravery, right? Like, and um, emphasizing the vulnerability that comes along with writing and sharing your work and, you know, exposing yourself and um, presenting something very close to your heart, to the world for critique. And so, yeah, just, um, bravery uh, in the face of inevitable criticism and rejection. Um, and also, I think at a more advanced level, I've really been preaching patience as an essential part of the writing life, or at least of my writing life, um, where, you know, as you are starting to master different aspects of craft, and you're gaining more confidence in your writing, there's no guarantee that the rest of the world will also acknowledge those things. And so, um, you know, I think it's tempting to want everything to happen quickly in your writing career. Um, and that hasn't been my experience at all. It's been a very slow and gradual build. And so I often have students telling me like they're freshmen and that they're going to have uh, like a best-selling novel by the time they graduate from college. Um, and it's hard sometimes to say that's probably not true, but um, also it's okay that that's probably not true because like it took me 10 years um, to complete my short story collection and to finally um, get that published. And if you had told me when I started that process that it would take so long and that there would be so much 
like pain <laughs> along the way, I probably would have been oh, like outraged and, and terrified. But now I feel really grateful for the time that it took and, you know, the way that I grew and the way that the stories reflect that growth. And so I've been trying to help my students see that patience and, you know, growth are important and they don't, they don't mean that you're not doing it right. Well, I think what Carrie and Ashley have said so far is really wise. Um, and I, I, I say versions of those kinds of things in my classes too. Um, thinking of this idea of patience though, um, I, I try to get students to be patient just inside the process of writing a story. Um, and I speak almost exclusively in analogies sometimes it seems, but I um, you know, think about writing a story as you're going on an actual trip in a car, you know, the kind of trip where you have time and can maybe go off the main path a little bit and to sit back and imagine the entirety of the story or the entirety of the journey before you even get started seems like such a, a series of missed opportunities in a way. It's like asking somebody on the first day of their week long road trip, how was the trip? What did you see? You, know, you don't know yet what you saw. So, you know, stay inside the story, moving slowly, looking around and seeing um, opportunities to surprise your own self as you're writing, rather than feeling like you need to imagine an exciting plot and then sort of fulfill that imagined thing. Thank you. Thank all, all May I add one you. thing, Heather? Yes, go uh, ahead. May I add one, one thing? Uh, and it's implicit in what Ashley and Daniel were, were saying, and that's the importance of character development as the core of story. It's developing your characters and really uh, spending time getting to know them and their, what they believe and what their quirks are, what they want, um, and uh, what they're willing to do to, to get what they want. Well, thank you. Um, I don't want to keep all of you any longer. It's um, we're, we're about uh, 10 minutes over and I know you're all uh, busy people and no doubt have great things to keep writing. <laughs> um, and uh, so thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. And um, thank you too for, uh, for watching this series and um, supporting Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary uh, literary uh, benefit. Um, on behalf of the Senator, Senate, Senate, Senator, see where my head is lately, the Center <laughs> for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, um, all our gratitude for the generosity of today's writers and also to um, the folks at the Anchorage Museum, Cody Carver, Rebecca Potterbaum, Adam Baldwin, who produced today's show um, and the uh, uh, Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center. So um, I'd also, um, like um, once again to um, thank those of you that are, are watching today and uh, remind you that while the series is free, um, if uh, you feel so moved, you may make a donation and uh, that will go a long way toward um, keeping Alaska Quarterly Review uh, going for another 40 years. Um, and uh, I hope all of you have a, a safe, uh, productive week and that you take good care of yourselves and if you can take good care of somebody else too. Um, Ron? Yeah, I uh, agree with everything you just said, Heather. <laughs> I, I want to thank uh, Ashley and uh, Daniel and Carrie for taking the time and for supporting us. Um, it's with great gratitude that um, we had the opportunity to work with you and continue to have that connection with you. So um, thank you so much. Um, in two weeks, we have our next uh, event, Sunday, February 28th. We're featuring two wonderful poets, Maxine Skates and Chris Martin, and AQR contributing editor, Bonnie Nadzim. Uh, she's a novelist, short story writer, and an essayist. So it should be a very interesting uh, event, and it's going to be mixed genre. So um, again, thank you all for joining us, and also thank you, Heather, for going the extra mile on this um, to help us out and bring such um, joy and finding the good uh, in 
all the things. Uh, Are you kidding me? I am so, it's such a privilege to be here Sunday afternoons with the writers that, I mean, Alaska Quarterly Review is like way up here and to have all of the, the people that we've um, gotten to, to hear, to listen to, to kind of meet, it's just um, been remarkable. So I want to thank you, Ron, for um, keeping, keeping this going and for your um, uh, good literary taste, I guess, is what it comes <laughs> down to. The, the people that you um, choose to publish have all are terrific and fascinating and um, very enlightening and inspiring. So, Well, it's an honor to work with the people we publish, but it's also an honor to get the work from the people we don't. And I know that that sounds kind of strange, but we have so many ways to make mistakes <laughs> with so many manuscripts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's quite an honor that people share their work. And as you know, Ashley was talking about, um, even the worst writing often sometimes, <laughs> there's a person behind it who may be just starting or may not be, but there's so much invested in it. Um, one of the reasons why we don't critique our people's pieces because maybe somebody else will have a different view of it. And why should we uh, make any opinions unless we wanna, we wanna uh, publish it? But anyway, it's quite an honor. So with that in mind, I guess we should um, sign off for today and uh, thank you all very much for uh, participating and helping us. So good afternoon for the people who are in Alaska and good evening for the people who are on the East Coast. And thank you and, and goodbye. Thank you.